Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, um, this should be a pretty familiar diagram. It's the uh, Joint Publication 2.0 Intelligence Model. Uh, and in a past life, when I used to work uh, HUMINT and SIGINT operations, and when I left for private industry, I realized that this diagram actually is a phenomenal in terms of um, <clears throat> explaining the relationship between data, information, and intelligence. So regardless of your operational environment, uh, if it's HUMINT, it's a physical environment. If it's SIGINT, it's a uh, virtual sort of remote environment. And if it's uh, in private industry, it's, it's your own network, right? And at the end of the day, you have all of these different collection sensors. And the sole job of that is to collect data, which is a raw observation of an event. And you've got to actually process and transform that data into information so it's actually consumable by an analyst. <clears throat> Uh, that information then can be interpreted for intelligence. And so um, this is actually a very great sort of model that uh, translates really well from the intelligence community into private industry. Uh, so why am I talking about this? Um, so one of the things is OSINT, uh, open source intelligence. And for uh, those of you who don't know, uh, it actually give you a little bit of history. The genesis of it started back in the 80s. Military and intelligence agencies were actually uh, transitioning from some of their traditional sources and methods. Uh, at the time, too, um, journalists were actually very quick and um, actually very accurate in the information that they were reporting. Uh, and so the military and intelligence services quickly realized that this was a valuable source of intelligence. And so, uh, like all things, they gave it an acronym. They called it OSINT. Um, but the thing with OSINT, too, is there's a very mutually symbiotic relationship with uh, OPSEC. So OSINT's really the uh, collection and analysis of data. Uh, from publicly accessible sources. And, and on the flip side of that coin is uh, OPSEC, which is a process by which you can take uh, in organizational information that's publicly available and publicly accessible to actually understand some of the harm and understanding if that information ever got leaked. Um, so the dot-com era, uh, and especially social media, uh, actually really kind of accelerated that. Uh, it turns out um, there are, in human operations, there are four basic uh, psychological motivators, money, ideology, coercion, and ego. <clears throat> Turns out people actually really like to talk about themselves and brag about themselves on social media. Uh, who knew? Uh, and as a result of that, um, there was really kind of this uh, abundance of information that was now publicly and freely accessible. Uh, so the practice of OSIN actually then eventually began, uh, began to pivot from these... Uh, historical intel communities into private industry. Um, so this is the intelligence process. Um, this should look familiar to most of you as well. Um, so uh, today, OSINT is actually very uh, topically focused. Uh, so generally around like CTI, cyber threat intelligence, or it's very target specific. You're trying to find something about a specific individual. Um, these tools typically focus on data gathering. Uh, and so Trouble today with um, OSIN is turns out if you don't have a billion dollars like the intelligence community, uh, you know, trying to standardize the data sources, schema, format, ontology, all of that, really hard. It's a non-trivial problem. Um, so, and this is also actually exacerbated by other challenges, which we'll talk about. But today, OSINT, uh, the collection, the, uh, the whole life cycle of it is actually very manual. Um, so we've highlighted here some of the things that are very hard to scale. Um, so from an OSINT anatomy perspective, we really kind of want to think of it in terms of sources, tools, frameworks, and services. Um, so what we did here was just kind of highlight some of the most popular uh, platforms that are available in OSINT today. Uh, with sources, uh, the challenge that you typically have is they're very ephemeral. Find a source. It's a good form of intelligence. The moment you pivot back to it, it's gone. Um, Tools, very focused on source dependence. So like the tools essentially have this kind of arms race in that their utility is only as good as their ability to maintain uh, new sources. Uh, the frameworks here are also source dependent, but again, we talked about some of the challenges of like uh, standardization. And so the uh, lack of ETLs and those data models make it really challenging to, for the frameworks to scale. Uh, and then we've got services, and these are, uh, a lot of them are unidentified sources, and they're very costly. Um, so this graphic just kind of shows what uh, OSINT really kind of looks like today. You start with a selector, hopefully a very strong DNI or DNR selector, and you start digging. 
Um, and then you kind of dig, dig, dig until you find a nugget and that lead then repeats the process and you actually have to, it's very nonlinear, so you kind of have to go back, it's a recursive, uh, and then you start digging again and it's, a, it's pretty much a wash, rinse, repeat. But the challenge you now have is when you go back, some of the sources that you were actually using are gone. Um, and eventually if you get good enough leads, you're done. Um, when I left uh, government and uh, was hired by a Fortune 50 company to build their insider threat and cyber counterintelligence program from the ground up, uh, we, we leveraged a lot of OSINT. And sometimes if you're familiar with like the uh, Jimmy Fallon like mean tweets, you know, some of the executives in the company, someone would tweet something mean at them and the executive would come and go, Dan, I wanna know who this is. I go, all right, well, you're paying me. I'll do whatever you need. So <laughs> a couple of days later, I'll go, all right, boss, here's what we got. Uh, but occasionally we actually got to do some cool shit. Uh, and so what I'll actually do is talk about one of that, uh, one of those uh, cases. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, this is actually like the human recruiting process. So typically, you know, you spot a target, uh, you will set up a bump so that you can actually start to develop that relationship. And then you will develop an, uh, a rapport. And eventually, uh, once you've gotten enough of a rapport, you'll recruit them. And at some point, um, you'll vet them. And then there's a handling phase. Uh, and then typically after that, the relationship ceases to be useful and you terminate the relationship with the asset. A lot of times, um, <clears throat> in um, all of the big insider threat cases, whether you talk about Snowden, whether you talk about things in private industry, the only time you ever see it is during the handling phase. So how do you get left of boom? Uh, so one of the most interesting cases I got to work <clears throat> um, actually involved an employee who had executed malware in the environment, hunt team, SOC team, all respond. They do the thing that they're supposed to do contain the malware, kick the asset off the network, interview the employee, interview the employee and he goes, oh yeah, uh, I got this uh, executable uh, from a person that I've been chatting with for like three years. The <coughs> hunter, sorry. <coughs> the director of the hunt calls me up and goes, hey, this might be a little weird. It feels a little weird, so he starts telling me the details of the case. And I go, uh, oh yeah, I know this exactly what it is. It's a blended operation. It's probably a nation state actor. They're using human to enable an offensive cyber operation. And um, so I was like, I need details on the, the individual and uh, give me as much details about the malware as you can. Um, so we get details on the individual. Turns out it's a virtual persona. Through OSINT, we're able to uh, attribute the virtual persona to a, a real individual who has like some Turkish social media site. So all of the images likeness is just pilched off, created in this new persona. Um, so, you know, this actually ha uh, happened during COVID. So rather than the physical bump, we had a hypothesis that it's going to be virtual. So we started to look at uh, LinkedIn requests, social media requests. So we built some uh, detection logic to actually look for the virtual uh, bumps. And so we actually started to see a bunch come in. Uh, and then we also kind of made a, an educated guess that uh, stroking the male ego, that we were probably going to have a bunch of middle-aged men who were targeted. Uh, and based on the persona, it was going to be someone, uh, a woman, who typically in their 20s to 30s, right? Or 20, between 20 and 30. Uh, so public service announcement for you men, you're not as good looking as you think you are. You're not as funny as you think you are. So if a woman's interested in you, you either have money or you have access to information they want. So, um, so with that, we built this profile um, and we actually uncovered about 50 employees inside of the company that were being targeted. There were about a dozen virtual personas. So in my mind, I was thinking, shit, is this actually multiple APTs all practicing the same playbook? Or is this a single uh, APT or nation state actor um, that just has a slew of virtual personas? So through OSINT, we look and we can see that none of the personas actually interact with each other on social media. So there's either extremely good operational rigor and discipline, or these are genuinely different actors. 
Uh, around this time, Labor Day, um, we actually start to see additional uh, malware come in. And um, oh, sorry, actually before that. Um, so of the 50 employees, we, we took into, we made kind of a decision based upon how far along we thought they were in the recruitment process. So there were about 10 that we narrowed down that we thought were pretty mature in the operational process here. Um, so what we actually did was then we figured out that a bunch of them were co-located at the same location. So we worked with the SOC team who handled the initial malware response. And we said, hey, we need you to put out an education and awareness campaign around malware and social engineering. We were monitoring the 10 individuals and we could actually see light bulbs go off in nine of the dudes where they go, oh, I'm really sad. I'm not as good looking as I thought I was. <laughs> you see them immediately disengage from the, uh, the personas. But there was one, open the email, one second later, deletes it. This is our guy. Labor Day comes around um, and we actually see the malware float in now. Um, and so we let it play out. And so I told my boss and told the SOC, there's gonna be malware in the environment, I want you to do nothing. And they were like, what? I go, just trust me. Uh, so we let it play out and um, we actually see the, then they try to establish persistence and actually trying to do recon and actually try to exfil some of the data out. Now, fortunately for us, they sucked in writing their malware. So it was unsuccessful in getting the malware out. But what we then did was realized, hey, we've got to probably build some man in the middle capabilities here so we can do a better job intercepting the malware, drop it in a quarantine, reverse engineer, and then try to go in and uh, sort of tactically remediate like the persistence suppress the C2, uh, but kind of let some of it play out. So we do this, um, and about the third malware that floats in, and one of the interesting things here too was they didn't choose a traditional uh, delivery mechanism. What they actually were using were um, hyperlinks through trusted collaboration services. So think of OneDrive, think of Slack. So rather than delivering an executable directly, they were actually just sending a OneDrive or a Slack URL, which then circumvents all of your traditional cybersecurity controls. So it was very clever. Um, now they would execute it and then they would say, hey, turn on macros, which is your worst nightmare in private industry, right? Um, so this comes in and uh, we, we actually go in immediately. Uh, we intercept it, send quarantine, reverse engineer it. We let it deliver to the box. We let it play out. Guy executes it. Um, and then so we go in, tactically suppress, um, you know, persistence and everything. And what was interesting too was we were trying to figure out why the dude kept clicking the URL. And then we realized it was a, uh, this PowerPoint slide of a very attractive Brazilian Zumba instructor. Uh, and at the end, it had, you know, little heart emojis and everything. We're like, oh, we get it now. <laughs> um, so, but what was really great about this particular piece of malware was the, uh, the nation state hacker was nice enough to embed the credentials um, into their C2. So obviously now in private industry, it's illegal for us to do anything active, but I was able to convince legal, hey, so we've got this code, we're gonna make some modifications, we're gonna take all the bad stuff out, we're gonna turn logging to 11, are you cool with that? And they were kind of like, eh, okay, we'll try this. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, typically in operations, there's really kind of two things you do. One is either be really covert, you gotta be super secret squirrel, or be over and just hide in the noise. So I figured this is our one shot we got to go in, try to see if we can get as much information out as quickly as possible. So we, we chose a ladder path. Uh, we went in, we, we reconned, uh, and we actually, and our speculation was that this was a C2 server, and it was. What we ended up finding was that all of the tasking for all of the targets that they were interested in was in this C2 server. So there were a bunch of US and UK companies that were all stacked up in the C2 server. Uh, so at that, that point, I called my old friends at CIA, NSA, and FBI and go, hey, I got something you might be interested in. Um, and so we started working some of the operations collectively. But the other thing too around this time is social media platforms actually changed their algorithms. So rather than you posting and uh, it being chronological in terms of when you post, it's showing up in your feed. Now they were doing this um, 
popularity sort of algorithm, right? So now based upon how many likes, re-likes or um, forwarding, like that was actually gonna get promoted up. So now we actually see a deviation in the trade craft. Um, so from a OSINT perspective, we see these personas actually interacting with each other now in an attempt to promote each other so that for the targets that they were in, those feeds would go up. So now it becomes a lot easier to track who's related to what. Um, so this actually occurs um, during the fall. It's like, all right, well, we all know government shuts down during Christmas, so do bad guys. Wait after the holidays, operations start back up. Um, and at that point, another piece of malware floats in. We're like, yes, we're back in business. Um, so unfortunately for us, one of the man in the middle capabilities we built trapped the malware into a sandbox. So we call up the vendor, we go, hey, we got this thing, we're interested in the sandbox, how do you get out? And they go, you can't do that. And anyway, that's really stupid. Um, so a week later, I get a call from them. They're like, hey, we're really excited. That thing you asked for, I, go, I didn't ask for anything. I go, well, you might be interested. There's a, we think there's an APT targeting you guys and we would like to sell you some threat intel. I was like, thanks. Uh, so unfortunately, after we uh, kindly told them, thanks, but no thanks, uh, they published a whole bunch of social media or they punished, published a, a bunch of blogs about it. Uh, and in, that, in the publishing of it, one of them went viral. And then the social media platforms saw it, realized it was their platforms on which the actors were operating on. And then they started to do systematic account takedowns, which totally decimated um, our OSINT, uh, as well as what was really a two year active counterintelligence operation for us. Um, so there were very colorful words from me to uh, that particular vendor. Um, and so we actually had a, a lengthy conversation um, over Tradecraft. But the other thing that this did too was it opened up conversations with the different social media platforms. And so we were able to engage them and say, hey, uh, there are times where account takedowns make sense, but there's also times where this is a really valuable form of OSINT and the intelligence gleaned from it is actually far valuable than the account takedowns. Um, so that really opened up a lot of uh, intelligence sharing between the social media platforms and the company I was at. Um, so it's just kind of a cool case study. <clears throat> All right, so the problem though with OSINT is it's very manual. And so typically if we're doing targeting, it could take days. And uh, in these types of operations, speed is more important than getting 100%. So scaling, there's hurdles and failures. Uh, we talked about the ephemeral sources. Um, but the other thing too now that's really annoying is um, a lot of the uh, different um, data sources try to have uh, attribution. So they're trying to fingerprint you uh, and they have all these active countermeasures. So typically now you actually have to create accounts in order to get access to some of the OSINT data. There's trackers, there's fingerprints, uh, and there's bot protections verifying that you're actually a human. So turns out scraping is, is frowned upon now, who knew? Uh, so, but the point here though, is that in order to do a lot of this, uh, it requires a lot of ephemeral infrastructure. Um, and, and that ephemeral infrastructure of setting up VPSs, VPNs, uh, these different personas and accounts, that actually takes a lot of time and it's a significant investment for most companies they don't either don't have the expertise and they don't have the willingness to do it. Um, the other challenge to you now is that there's really a monetization of data um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, uh, but basically everyone wants to sell data. Uh, my, my brother, um, he used to work at an umbrella company and the boss was like, um, I wanna put this chip in and sell data related to the umbrella and my brother goes, he like didn't know who to talk to. So he goes, Dan, what do you think? I go, I was like, who the fuck is gonna care about umbrella data? Who's going to buy this? And he was like, fair point. Uh, so the other thing too with uh, those vendors that have direct access is uh, you have others that are out there that are actually doing aggregation of data and then they're repackaging it and then selling it. So with the monetization really, Data is about selling user data, and typically that also involves some amount of PII. 
uh, when I was in government, we didn't have any rights. So like, I didn't know PII was actually important in private industry until I met our privacy lawyer and I quickly learned I was wrong. <laughs> uh, but with uh, social media, um, you know, all the things that used to be free and those API accesses, like, so think of Twitter, think of uh, Reddit, all of a sudden now they were really annoyed because you had LLMs that were just crawling and scraping all of this free content in order to build up their algorithms and analytics. And then these companies got pissed that someone was making money off of their data. So then what they ended up doing was replacing those free API accesses with different types of subscription plans, which now made using these data sources far more expensive. Um, now, what we see though typically is a lot of the data aggregators are actually just using LinkedIn, scraping all the data, they're repackaging and going, hey, I got new data for you. Uh, and then mobile apps, obviously, uh, if you go into like the uh, iTunes app store, for example, you'll see in the fine print at the bottom, they always talk about what data and what privacy data that they're collecting and selling, right? So always take a look at that. All right, so, um, you know, having been in private industry and for those of you uh, who have a better half, um, there is no better cyber sleuth than a wife and her girlfriends, right? Uh, but turns out that's really hard to scale. Um, so what we wanted to do was go, hey, how do we do something like this at scale? Um, so we wanted to pick something, and so we, we thought, there's data leaks. There's always a data breach. Every week you hear about something, right? Uh, one of the downsides, though, is that it's static. And so, but at least you know at that point in time, there's valuable information in there. Um, so what we, what we started to do was try to take a look at some of these data breaches and data leaks. Uh, and then we started to figure out, hey, how do we deal with the different types of formats, the different types of data types? It's all very heterogeneous. And then you also have different file diversity as well. So a JSON, one day the breach could be in JSON format. Three months later, that same breach could be in a CSV format, right? It's all completely different in terms of the structure and what's the, the fields, the values, et cetera. Um, and then the other challenge that you have too is uh, within the data, things are defined, but there's also things that are complete free flow user input. Those suck. Uh, but really now, if we look at all the different data breaches, you almost have too much data. Um, and so with that quantity, there's this balance now of trying to figure out how do you get good quality data out of it. And on that note, I will turn it over to Devin, who's far smarter than me. Okay. All right. Oops. Okay. So given the diversity among schemas, sources, formats, you name it, we run into a lot of collisions with data quality when collecting this at scale. I'm not going to walk through all these uh, benchmarks here, but this is what we kind of hold ourselves to with any data we work with, all the way from ingestion to that making it to the consumer. Um, but what I do want to point out is that um, there is no single source of truth out there on the internet. So you take all these leaks, you take all this data, and there's not one single source that is just an absolute source of truth. And so to get to a point where you feel like an entity is accurate and valid, you have to be able to take all these sources, munch them together, cross-reference, and then from there you can say with some level of confidence, mm, I believe that this record is accurate and valid because it exists in you know, these 10 sources and has these X amount of attributes. So that's what we're dealing with here, and that's the way I like to think about it. Okay, this is an example of just some of the data we deal with and how messy it is, and I'll walk through just this mock data set with you guys. So you might find records that, if you look at the content themselves, looks fairly accurate, but it's shifted. So you gotta figure out how do we recover data that's actually good data, push it to the right schema in the right rows. You'll have data that you're not sure of, so we're not getting any kind of data definitions, schema definitions, and occasionally we're not even getting field names when collecting this breached and leaked data. So as an analyst, you have to take a look at it and say, what am I really dealing with here? Kind of similar, you might have data that you just don't have the tools or the knowledge to work with and extract. And then like Dan mentioned, user input is a pain in the butt. Uh, you'll have lazy, garbage inputted data, freeform text is a nightmare for analysts. Um, you'll have different formats, you'll have typos, spelling errors, you name it, we see it. And then data uniqueness. So think about 
emails, phone numbers, account names. These are identities or identifiers that can be owned and disowned at will over time. So you might see entities sharing the same phone number. You might see, you know, John Doe in rows two and row six having two different usernames across two different sources. There's conflicting information here. How do we resolve all this down and how do we deconflict? Before I get into the nitty gritty of like the data cleansing, the resolution, I wanna talk about at a high level how intelligence is disseminated from its raw form all the way to the end user in its most consumable form. So it starts out with planning. We take a look at what are our core capabilities? What are we trying to build? Who and what things do we care about? And then what data do we need to collect to supplement the things that we care about? We go then collect that data, process it. It goes to our gold layer where our analytics lie. And then that's disseminated to the user. The user then provides uh, us feedback and that then informs our future and our current processes. So maybe we need to go back and recollect, refactor, or reformat. Now getting into the data specifics. So we collect all this data. It sits in raw storage. We then have bronze processors that push it to our bronze layer. Our bronze layer is essentially our raw 2.0, which is a more consumable version. So everything here sits in delta tables. This is where we reformat. We might you know, rename columns. We might inject timestamps, essentially just a reformatting stage. From there, we have silver processors that push everything into our silver data layer. And this is where all of the data normalization and validation happens at scale. So here we match everything to our data model, we restructure the schemas, um, and that's where we do a lot of data validation and cleansing techniques. I'll walk through a few of them, just three, um, but there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes. Okay, I'll start with live phone number. This is a technique that we use for identifier validation, in this case, phone numbers. Uh, this is actually Google's library for parsing, validating, and uh, formatting international phone numbers. It's open source, so you can go up on Git, grab this data down, join it to your own data, and then you can validate your own phone numbers. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, we started out with a series of regex joins, then we kind of tried to implement the, that API wrapped inside a UDF, and some even uh, pandas UDFs. And what we found was like none of these scaled with the volume of data that we had, and we actually lost a little a bit of precision, excuse me, when pushing it through the API and running those small scale lookups. So those didn't work, and we were, where we landed here was range joins. So how this works is we pull that data down, we extract it, we create the raw ranges, we create the range buckets, and then we actually break up the lib phone number library into a series of smaller data frames. From there, at the same time, we normalize our own phone numbers and clean them as much as we can, and then we iterate through a series of range joins, join those back to our data, and now we have all these validated phone numbers. Now, it might not seem super cool, but you know, down the line when we have hundreds of millions of phone numbers in our data and we can competently say that, I don't know, 70% of those are valid, uh, that's pretty cool. The next is location normalization. So this is a big issue that we actually still deal with and are working on. If we go back to the freeform text nightmare, you'll see there's like six different permutations of the city, Baltimore, Maryland. And the goal is to get these all down to one normalized location. And at one point we were like, well, let's just build our like own entity extraction pipeline where we use NER to build out uh, countries, regions, cities, you name it, pull them out of our data, join them to a, um, a OpenStreetMaps data source. And then from there we get geolocated data. But we quickly found that to build something like that, you need to spend a lot more time, money, and a lot more effort tuning it. So we figured what can we use in the meantime to at least normalize our locations at scale. And here we landed at geo lookups. So here we use an API to pre-process all of our data. We take all of our location strings, pre-process them, normalize them as much as we can. From there we push it all to the API. The API runs those lookups, we pull it back. We now have like an enriched, resolved data set of all of these normalized locations. This we use as enrichment to join back to our own data, and now we have normalized locations. So super easy, quick, and efficient. Works for us in the meantime. Might not want to be where we uh, land long term, but works for us right now. The next is PySpark transform. So this is just a kind of a technique we use. It's like our bread and butter, and we use this for all of our data validation at scale. So. You basically just create a set of custom functions, you throw it up in a script, and you can call it uh, within the transform itself. And we use this for everything from 
identify our validation. Our lib phone number actually sits inside a transform. We use it for extracting uh, relevant data out of our data sets. We do it for restructuring entire schemas, uh, normalization. We build analytics off of this. So we use it for really everything. And, um, and it's great because you just put it up in a script and you can call it across all of your silver tables and you have data quality and data normalization at scale. Okay, so back to this diagram, um, I wanna talk real quick about the process of getting our data from silver to our gold layer. So all the data is normalized now, it's sitting in silver, but we've got all these disparate tables. While they're normalized, you know, we've gotta figure out one way to munch them together. How do we get our data in gold where we can create solid, robust entities that we care about? Now this is where NAD resolution comes into play. I like to say this is the fun part. Um, so this is all about correlating and resolving people down um, across data sets, but within data sets. Record linkage and deduplication are the buzzwords of ER. So you probably heard those, we're all familiar with it, um, but there's so many different approaches to NAD resolution. I'm gonna walk through just a few of the ones that we've researched, we've tried, and I'll talk about maybe why they're not working for us, and then I'll walk into our custom approach to an ED resolution. So graph databases, it's a natural first step to, you know, when you wanna correlate things together, to take all your data, generate your edges, generate your nodes, throw it into graph, let graph do the heavy lifting, makes sense, right? But what we noticed was this won't work for us in the meantime. So the first is time. It takes a, quite a while to populate and load your objects into graph and we ran into memory issues several times, but not a big issue because we can just load everything in in batches. Not a big issue. However, regen. Every time we wanna change our schema, we need to regen the graph. So we're constantly collecting new data all the time, incorporating new schemas into our data all the time. So maybe this isn't you know, the right option for us is given the time and the regen, maybe we don't go this route. The last is cost, and this is more towards the cost of storing data in graph. Sometimes when you push your documents to graph, what it does is it generates a unique UUID for all of the properties in your particular document. So you might be throwing two gigs in, but you're really storing four. So just another concern we had, probably where we wanna land long-term, but in the current moments, dev stages, not where we're at right now. The next are these open source tools. So these are great if you have no knowledge of NAD resolution, you've got no labeled data, and you wanna perform record linkage and deduplication relatively quickly. Um, and they do so through a series of block, match, and merge phases. So how this works is you've got your data kind of floating in space. I, as the user, say I want you to block or cluster all these individuals together based on a series of rules that I set. Because you're not gonna to wanna to take every record in your database and match it with every other record. You have millions of records, that's just computationally expensive. So we set these deterministic rules. The tools then first block or cluster people together. Then the pairwise matching is, is taking place. So every person and every cluster is paired together. That is then pushed to a feature vector matrix. So each feature is actually translated into embeddings and then similarity is ran across those embeddings to produce this matrix. So what you see here in the number three, uh, you've got essentially the similarity scores for all of your features. The algorithm looks at this and says, based on you know, the weighted average of this matrix, the probability of them being a match is 0.54 in this case. Not where we wanna be. I, as the user, say I don't want you to merge people unless the probability is above, let's say 0.9. Therefore, the tool looks at this and says, we're not gonna merge them. Sounds great, right? Sounds easy but we ran into a few issues with this as well. So the first is time. So Splink actually has in their documentation, it says link one million records in under a minute. Maybe that's true if you just have records with like users first and last name, and that's all your feature uh, vector matrix consists of. Our data and our documents are so complex and we have so many nested properties that this just wasn't working for us, wasn't scaling. The second is missing data. Doesn't work great with missing data. It's not able to associate records where the majority of the fields are missing with their next closest match. 
The last is granularity. So if we take a look at this diagram over here, you've got James and Jimmy, probably an alias. They share the same date of birth, share some of the same identifiers. They're both males. I would look at this as an analyst, and I'd probably say, these are the same person. Let's match them together. Splink would look at this, and they would say, mm, James is missing an address. That's the probability going to go down. They don't share the same first name, therefore the probability is down, and James doesn't have all of the same identifiers. So very low probability, we're not going to match these two. At the same time, Splink might look at Janice and Jimmy, probably husband and wife, right? They share the same address, and they might say the probability is higher because they share the same last name, they share same, some of the same identifiers, and they've got the same address. So the Splink, the tool might link these two together, while failing to link you know, aliases. So you can't really achieve a level of granularity that we need when it comes to resolving these entities down at scale and, um, and building out these robust profiles. Yeah, so, so get rid of Janice. Um, I wanna talk about knowledge bases real quick because this goes into like our custom approach. So the idea of having a knowledge base is you've got your base set of entities and any new entities that you bring into your data set, you want first compare them with the base. And by some custom approach, you say, you know, on this threshold, I want to either merge or I want to append them to our knowledge base. And it, it works with the idea that like, you know your knowledge base isn't going to be perfect. It's not going to be correct 100% of the time. But over time, it sort of procures itself. You're adding in entities, you're merging entities together, you're building out those profiles, and then you're appending new ones to the KB as they don't uh, merge with any other entities. So that's the idea of a KB and that's how that works. This is our approach. So we leverage a little bit of graph, graph frames, and then we also use the KB approach. We use graph to link all the things together, do the heavy lifting, and then we have a custom approach that takes a look at what graph outputs, reevaluates it, and then curates a KB from there. So let's talk about graph. So we've got all our silver tables. We generate our edges, we generate our nodes. We throw it in graph frames. We only really care about the connected components. We don't care how things are connected. We just care that they're connected in general or in some way. So we take the output of the connected components. You get essentially a data frame where each person is assigned an ID and you've got these clusters of people that belong together. But just wait because our graph is now on fire. So the messy thing about open source and breach data when it comes to graph is going back to the uniqueness of those identifiers. So you've got multiple registrations going on, family members using the same email or phone to register with a certain service, or you've got you know, high volume identifiers like a Twitter account with thousands of phones and emails attached because maybe it's a bot account. Um, so these cause graph explosions. We don't love these, so what we do is we actually run analytics prior to graph and silver to identify these and actually just filter them out. So we get rid of that. And now we curate our knowledge base. So our filters don't necessarily fix everything. There's still gonna be stuff that trickles through that shouldn't be connected. So this is why we take this approach. We take everything from graph, it's no longer exploded. We take all of the attributes for all of the entities that we care about. We take a bunch of enrichment data that we use for resolution downstream, join all that together, and what you're left with is clusters of records of people who belong together. We then take a look at what graph outputs those clusters, and we say, we need to customize this and reevaluate it. So we have a bunch of custom algorithms that kind of walk through this data and do exactly that. We start out with some name conversion, so converting any non-English name to English for name similarity algorithms downstream. Then we have a function that says, okay, let's take these clusters, let's recluster them based on our own custom deterministic rules and similarity algorithms. Now we have new clusters, and then with all the new clusters, we're gonna send those to a consolidation function. That's gonna take all of the person attributes that you have and resolve them down into a single consolidated profile. And what you end up with is a gold layer, oops, of consolidated entities. So James and Jimmy are now combined. We know that Jimmy has an alias James. He's somehow related to Janice. And we know that Janice is somehow related to Jimmy. And the goal of this and the fun part about this is using these profiles for targeting. So we can look at Jimmy and we can say, what do we know about him as a person based on his social media presence, based on his location, based on his biographical information, his gender, his date of birth, 
his relationship status? Or what do we know about him based on who he affiliates himself with or his intellectual experience? So we can take all this data on these entities, correlate and resolve it down, and we can build these solid, solid profiles on these individuals and figure out really who are you. And with that, that's the fun part. Uh, the, the hard part is, you know, and the boring part, the resolution, the cleansing, the validation. But with that, I'll let Dan take it away. He's gonna walk through a case study. So in human operations, we kind of have this thing we call the 1% rule, which is 1% of any organization has been compromised. So either they've been recruited or they're doing something nefarious. Uh, when I first joined this Fortune 50 company, my first week there, uh, there were two incidents I dealt with. One was an employee um, who got in trouble, stole a bunch of data. Uh, and as we were kind of looking back through the background check and stuff, we realized the employee had been incarcerated, and but on their resume, there was a two-year gap, a sabbatical, explained it. Uh, but the point here, though, is that background checks, um, they typically are very static. They look at a handful of things, and if you pass the background check, it's e really easy to slip through the cracks. Uh, so what we wanted to do was to try to see, um, could we take something, a recent case study, right? and actually try and apply some of the techniques that Devin talked about uh, and see if actually, you know, we could do something better. Um, so here's a recent case study. If you've seen it in the news in the last week, uh, a friend of mine, Jess, she sent this and I was like, this could be a really interesting case study for us to actually try this out on. So it shouldn't be a surprise that uh, ch a Chinese couple were caught spying, but when there's 1.4 billion of them, it's hard to do manual OSINT on all of them, right? So what we did was uh, we took the article, there were just names in there, we ran the names, uh, we actually got a hit in a graph component. So the husband, uh, Chris Hugh, we were able to uh, get a correlation with an email address and a phone number. From that, we were actually very able, uh, we were able to very quickly, uh, through the process that Devin had talked about, actually get an entity resolution here. So now, uh, based on Linda Sun and Chris Hugh, which we only started with two names, we actually figured out all of their aliases. Uh, we were also able to figure out their address, their Instagram accounts, their Facebook accounts, their Facebook ID, LinkedIn account, email addresses, and different phone numbers. Um, now the husband also, the phone number here, you look at it and go, that doesn't look kosher, right? It looks like a weird number. It's actually the phone number that they used for uh, one of many different uh, cutout companies that they had established. So this particular phone number that we found through our knowledge base was actually correlated to Foodie Fisherman LLC. No idea what they sell. Uh, but from that, because we got all the selectors now, we could very quickly crawl through all of the social media. And you can see that there is quite a pre uh, presence on social media. And again, it goes back to people love to talk about themselves on social media. Um, so we got Facebook, uh, we got Instagram, uh, but we also got Pinterest accounts. And if you take a quick look at the Pinterest accounts, a lot of the pins there are kind of focused on like home renovation, home improvement, decoration stuff. So uh, we looked at it from a socioeconomic perspective and it turns out uh, the husband had a YouTube account and one of his favorite videos he loved to play was how to obtain financing with a land trust anonymously. Turns out this was a precursor for this guy buying a $4.8 million home. And if you can see here, uh, the ownership there is trust. There is no name, right? Uh, so from the motivator perspective, if you look at the social media content, a lot of the social media there is focused on wealth, uh, just volumes and volumes of new and unexplainable wealth. Um, so, you know, what we tried to do is kind of take some of the traditional uh, human kind of approaches, kind of look at different things like biographical information, socioeconomics with that, right? from a motivator perspective, going back to mice, money ideology, coercion, ego, clearly money is the focus here. From an approachability perspective, their social media presence was just everywhere, right? 
Uh, and then the other thing that we were able to find with this were different associations, foreign business ties, these different squirrely companies. Uh, and then also with every social media post, you can always uh, either directly or indirectly uh, get geos and events as well. Um, so the point here, though, is that uh, what normally would take you know, days, if not weeks, to conduct OSINT um, with this sort of approach of the graph knowledge base and the entity resolution, we were able to fast pass all of that digging and all of that sort of manual, iterative, uh, recursive process, and we were able to pull all of this together in less than an hour. Um, now, that being said, um, I'm not necessarily telling you all to go and buy all of the breach data and leaked data, uh, because one, that's illegal. And, but if you happen to know someone who has access to the data, it's a gray area, but I'll also caveat that I'm not a lawyer, so. Uh, so questions? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, earlier on, when you were describing the story about the individuals who ran malware in your environment, um, and you mentioned that you enumerated 15 other actors in Google who were running company. Um, but what was that process like? Did you see like side correspondences that were ongoing over long term? And so, yeah, I'm curious if you check this one. Uh, sorry, what do you mean by enumeration exactly? Well, you said there's about a dozen other people in the company that were at risk, and then you sent the training email to them. Yep. But how did you identify roughly those 12 people or what they thought were faced with something like that? Like, uh, so, w what we did was um, so basically, kind of with a virtual bump, what you'll see is like a LinkedIn friend request, right? And then you'll see some initial kind of LinkedIn messages go back and forth. Eventually, that rapport will have been built, and then you'll start to share personal contact information or email addresses. So you'll see a pivot from the LinkedIn platform messaging to emails and or like uh, sharing of phone numbers and that kind of stuff. So once you kind of see that transition, now you know, hey, this is more than just a, a social contact. Now there's some level of interaction. Um, and what we we had a very uh, specific legal approval process. So kind of think of it like a uh, a search warrant. And so with that sort of uh, search warrant equivalent, what it did was it it gave us legal authority and access to be able to pull uh, email addresses to be and in, in, in private industry we have tools called uh, UAM user activity monitoring. It's really nothing more than like your offensive cyber toolkit. But with that, it, you can basically kind of enumerate everything. You can monitor everything. You can take screenshots, video capture, et cetera. So with the UAM tools uh, on these employees, we were basically doing all of this enhanced monitoring. Initially, when I came into the company, I was like, we're going to recon. And the lawyers were like, you're going to do what? And I was like, oh, we're going to call it enhanced monitoring. But um, so with the enhanced monitoring, that's what we did. And But turns out um, trying to do you know, enhanced monitoring of like a dozen employees, very time intensive. And, uh, you know, when, when I was an offensive operator, we only had to be lucky in once, right? Right. And once you got your access and your foot in the door, you were good. When you're playing defense, you can't afford to be wrong once. So that meant the team was essentially operating 24 seven to make sure that we could monitor these employees and kind of figure out, <clears throat> um, you know, when things were coming in. It wasn't sustainable, and so I, I immediately recognized we needed to do something to reduce that volume down, which is why we, I, we came up with the idea of doing the uh, education and awareness to kind of see, okay, who's going to click and go, this is me who was socially engineered. But what we did was we saw that sort of progression, right, to email and the correspondences, and then with that too, I mentioned earlier that um, at some point they would eventually start sending them links uh, and so in human operations, like uh, when you're developing an asset, you give them tasking. And the first initial set of tasking, very benign, you don't actually care about um, the end result of it. All you care about is that they're performing the tasking that you're doing. And it's a form of conditioning. So the first couple of hyperlinks we saw come in, there was no malware. It was simply validating that when they got a link, they click it and they did the thing that they were supposed to do. And after the employee was conditioned, then they would then shoot in a link that actually had a malware executable with it. So these are all sort of human, sort of uh, tradecraft behaviors that 
uh, from a past life we were familiar with. And so we kind of took that same approach uh, from a cyber perspective. So, and so for those employees where we saw them clicking links and then through the proxy logs, we could see that they were being redirected. We were like, okay, these guys are further along in that human recruitment process because they're actually getting conditioned and tasked, right? And so at some point, they're gonna get a piece of malware. Any other questions? Um, I, I had a question about how the, the, the graph um, stuff was going on. Um, so I know you described in the beginning that the graph generation was tedious and was not a very good uh, route to do your um, clustering. Did removing the edges in that, like the last section that you were talking about, did removing edges and all the other data speed that up? Or is that still, like, is the processing of that still difficult? So, so we started out with a graph database because it's almost like the natural step is to just throw it in the database and let them connect all the things. But the issue there was not necessarily, like time isn't really an issue. It's a concern for us because yes, it does take time. It's more the regen. It's like mm -hmm. we're still collecting schema, new schemas all the time and we're incorporating it into our data model. That was the issue with the graph databases. So we use graph frames and we use that library to create our edges, create our nodes, push everything into graph. Um, we don't create bi-directional, we just kind of have it a one-way graph. So from there, we just generate the connected components and we care about all the things that are connected. We don't necessarily care about the relationships themselves. So, so yeah, that's why it's, it's quicker. Um, and for us, it's just a better option in the short term. And when you were using the knowledge database, you weren't regening as often? Like, was it, was it being created as you, as you process the data? The knowledge base is getting, yes, it's regen every time graph is updated. Okay. So we have a process that every time we get new dynamic data coming in, we run an update to our graph and then our PKB updates. And so okay. that would update simultaneously. Gotcha. Yeah. What uh, source uh, methods do you have in your graph database to weed out entities from like European Union, places that have very strong legal restrictions about containing their PII? Dan, you want to take that? <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, could you repeat the question again? <clears throat> so you're assembling a large quantity of PII information of people from random areas around the world. Um, if you do any business in places like Europe or other entities, there's very strong PA restrictions about containing that data and storing it. So do you have controls to weed out that data if you are asked by those entities? Yeah, so that's a great question. And to your point, um, there, there are very strict sort of privacy laws that are uh, regional and country specific. Um, so one of the things that we are doing is we're actually almost exclusively focused on U.S. entities and U.S. individuals. Uh, and that way, the, um, some of the data requirements in terms of the provenance, the storage, the retention of it, how you're handling it, <clears throat> all of those issues kind of go away uh, for like GDPR or, you know, even Canada with um, like its privacy laws. Any other questions? Yep. Correct. <laughs> um, so I think ultimately he was unwitting um, to a degree. Um, I think he was genuinely invested in the relationship and we could see through the enhanced monitoring that um, he was trying to make plans to meet up in person, uh, which was going to be quite difficult given this is a virtual persona and, uh, and it turns out it's probably a dude. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, he was, uh, we think he was unwitting, but what was really interesting was um, towards the end, we got a piece of malware that came in uh, and um, one of the, 
guidelines I had from my boss was, hey, the moment you think you can't control this, you got to make sure that we can back out. So we got a piece of malware in um, and we didn't feel we could actually contain it uh, properly. So we actually didn't allow it to go through. The employees started to realize I'm not getting an email because, and then we realized there was out of band communications where uh, the persona must have been, hey, why haven't you clicked this link and opened this thing? And um, so, um, and then he was actually trying desperately to fill out this survey, right, and then send it back. Um, and we actually saw him trying to circumvent the cybersecurity controls inside of the company. So at that point, what was unwitting now was an intentional act. Uh, and after the vendor had burned us, at that point, I decided we're going to do a counterintelligence interview of the employee. So I flew down, um, interviewed the employee, uh, and so we tried to get them to explain what was going on. Um, and for about four hours, just nonstop bullshit, uh, just lying. And so uh, at lunch, we, I kind of turned the, the knobs and said, hey, so I'm going to show you some stuff. You tell me what you think. Turned the laptop, presented all the data that we had on him. And uh, do you want to change anything you've told us in the morning? At that point, the dude felt, you could tell it was like he got punched in the nuts. Um, and his first question was, are you going to tell my wife? <laughs> it's like, uh, sir, no, we don't care about your, uh, your marriage, but you are in the process of applying for a security clearance. And as a result of your actions, you are actually permanently blacklisted. And so you will never be able to obtain a clearance and you will be lucky if you still retain employment at this company. Um, but yeah, so it started out unwitting and then it did escalate at some point where um, it became reckless. And so we had to kind of intervene. Any other questions? Do you think that was just lack of training or because we, we do a lot of the phishing stuff and generally they send out like one link and if you click on it, you get your name and a report. But do you think it was just lack of training in this individual or just they were just so far down that pathway? Like technology wouldn't solve this, even though you saw the malware in your environment before it detonated. Like the, the initial attack of the phishing through Slack or Box. Like, was there, is there just the human element here or is there a technology solution? There was a 100% a, a human element. So what was really interesting about this particular counterintelligence case was the nation state actor um, actually spent on average three years developing a relationship with the employee before they would actually escalate it into something. As a former uh, operations officer, we never had that luxury of three years. You would never have anyone support you and going, you're going to just schmooze this person and spend money and you're getting no intel for three years? Not happening. So it was really fascinating that um, the operational rigor and discipline of this nation state actor to spend three years without getting any intelligence just to hook uh, you know, an unwitting target in, like, it was really kind of fascinating from our perspective because, you know, we've, we never did that uh, within our community. So it's definitely a human element. Um, you know, like you pointed out, we have all of the cybersecurity education awareness of, you know, phishing attacks and social engineering. Um, but there's just nothing that prepares you for this unless you were a former intelligence officer. hundred percent. Yeah. And it also turns out men are dumb. And if you're hot, you're really dumb. <laughs> was, there one was, was there any indication that the adversary had the individual to apply for security clearance? Uh, it's unclear. So we don't know um, if, you know, that was sort of... Um, you know, we, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But what was kind of interesting um, was the cleared position was overseas and our hot Zumba instructor was based out of the UK and the position that they were applying for was also in the UK. So coincidence, maybe, but 
um, hard to say. We did, we just didn't have enough visibility or, or telemetry data to to give us that indication of whether it was uh, you know guided. Great, thanks, Dan and Devin. Let's give them applause. <laughs>